reporting, Peter Jennings. Hello again, everyone, and good evening. Now we begin our primetime coverage of this deeply felt anniversary. Some days ago, when we were preparing, I walked in here to see this adaptation of New York City, including this representation of the Trade Towers, and I realized, as millions of other people have, what a signature they were against the New York skyline. As one photographer said of them in a picture tribute, it's helped us remember them not as rubble, not as mass graves, but as symbols of strength and courage and unity. Our broadcast tonight is about all that and more about what the country may be facing as well as what we have been through. We all know, I think, that this has been one of the most documented days in any nation's history. It is about memory, of course, and it is also about history. ABC's Charles Gibson is with us tonight and helped us to begin the day. Um, this was, in a phrase, a moment of crisis which not a soul that I know of anticipated. Well, Peter, as well we remember, no one had a complete picture of what was going on a year ago today, not in the media and not in government either. So we set out to put the day together, minute by minute. We have interviewed not just the leaders of government, but the pilots scrambled that day, the air traffic controllers, the generals issuing the orders, the sergeants taking them, photographers, stenographers. When you see the day from all those perspectives, well, I think you'll find it gripping. The day of confusion and crisis started with calm and clarity. Across America, September 11th dawns crisp and clear. It is one of those late summer mornings when almost anything seems possible, except what is about to happen. Come on. The president is in Sarasota, Florida, on a two-day swing to promote his education agenda. He goes for his usual early morning run. Sure about tax cuts? Not right now. And in New York City, here at ABC. Good morning, America. How nice to see all of you. I'm Charles Gibson. I'm Diane Sawyer. It's Tuesday, September 11th. Looking pretty good so far. We've got 60 degrees at Dulles Airport, 66 at Reagan National today. In Washington, everyone is talking about Michael Jordan and will he return to pro basketball. WTLB News Time, 831. But at that very moment, in the headquarters of the Northeast Air Defense Sector in upstate New York, something is amiss. I have FAA on um, shout line, Boston Center. They said they have a hijacked aircraft. NEADS, as the Air National Guard installation is known, is part of NORAD, the North American Air Defense Command, and Colonel Bob Marr is in charge. I was already in the battle cab that morning. We had the fighters with a little more gas on board, a few more weapons on board. On this morning, they are in the midst of a full-scale training exercise. Normally, there would be only a handful of military fighters on duty across the U.S. We had 14 aircraft on alert. Uh, seven sites, two aircraft at each site. At a command center at Tyndall Air Force Base, Florida, Major General Larry Arnold hears about a bogey, an unidentified aircraft. The first thing that went through my mind was, is this part of the exercise? Is this some is kind of a screw-up? Back in upstate New York, Master Sergeant Maureen Dooley is supervising radar operations. We have a real hijack going on, so then, you know, boom. <clears throat> We're all in, in the urgency. Lieutenant Colonel Dawn Deskins is the mission crew chief for the exercise. And I picked up the line and identified myself to the Boston Center controller, and he said, uh, we have a hijacked aircraft, and I need you to get some sort of fighters out here to help us out. So what I did was call General Arnold and said, boss, I need to scramble Otis. And I said, go ahead and scramble them, and we'll get the authorities later. At Otis Air National Guard Base in Massachusetts, two F-15 fighters are at their battle stations. Engines quiet. Cockpits empty. Right about that same time that I was making that call, American Airlines Flight 11 Heavy was crossing the border from Massachusetts into New York, and he turned off his transponder. Top guns, with the code names Duff and Nasty, wait for orders. The radio crackles. He said, it's Otis Tower, something about a hijacking. He said, this looks like the real thing. The pilots fire their engines and roll under the runway. At NEADS, radar operators desperately search for American Flight 11. At this point, we don't really know where the aircraft is. We just know that the FAA has lost contact. Its transponder is off, so the airliner no longer signals its identity, altitude, or speed. 
the 767 is lost amid the clutter of more than 2,500 planes in the air this morning over the northeast alone. We were going by the old-fashioned method of what was his last known speed, his last known heading, his altitude, and we are trying to kind of map it out on the scope. I hate to say it, but that was probably one of the, a perfect tactic because it's a perfect arrow right to lower Manhattan. It is 8.46 a.m. This is an ABC News special report. Good morning America was in progress in the East Coast and the Midwest, but we're joined by the entire network just to show you some pictures at the foot of New York City. This is at the World Trade Center. Pretty dramatic uh, picture we're looking at right now. Fire in uh, one of the World Trade Center towers in uh, New York City. I, as I look at it now, there's a diagonal angle across the building uh, at about a 45 degree angle, and it looks like just a definite gash. The upper right hand side looks like it's the corner of a wing that just went straight into the building. See, there's quite a lot of damage. Uh, it, if it was a, an airplane, it had to be huge. Breaking news now on 1010 Winds. This just into our newsroom, a plane has crashed into the World Trade Center. At that exact moment, the president's motorcade arrives at an elementary school in Sarasota, Florida for a long planned event. Simultaneously, the pagers of his aides erupt in a cacophony of beeps and tones. It goes into the, the school. Um, Carl Rove and I and some others were standing there <clears throat> and informed him of this, in which he, being a former pilot, had kind of the same reaction going, was it bad weather? And we said, no, apparently not. The president was surprised. He thought it had to be an accident. The president ducks into an empty classroom and calls National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice back in Washington. He said, what a terrible, it sounds like a terrible accident. Keep me informed. In the command center in New York, a TV set shows the World Trade Center on fire. And the immediate assumption is that that guy that, that we couldn't find probably hit, hit the World Trade Center. But the FAA still lists American Flight 11 as unaccounted for. They told us that um, they showed the American Airlines Flight 11 was still airborne. So now we're looking at this while well, if an aircraft hit the World Trade Center. Who was that? Whoever it is, Colonel Deskins knows she needs to call NORAD operations in Florida to inform the public affairs officer, Don Arias. And his reaction to me at that point was, my God, my brother works in the World Trade Center. And I said, well, you have to go call your brother. Arias hears the shock in his brother's voice. So, uh, not the typical phone voice I expected, you know. And uh, he was just like, hey, you know, he's the heard a lot of background noise. He says, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on here now. The Air Force officer is a former New York City firefighter, so he knows what his brother is up against. He says, he says you're not going to believe what I'm looking at here. I said, what? He says, people are at the windows. He says, there's a guy falling out of the building next door. He says, there are people jumping. And I said, you know, uh, I think I just got a call from, from the Northeast Air Defense Sector. There's a uh, hijacked plane. I think that's the plane. At that same moment, three blocks from the White House at the St. Regis Hotel, two old friends meet for breakfast at a window table. George Tenet is the director of Central Intelligence. His companion this morning is David Boren, the former chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee. And out of the corner of my eye, I could see several people converging on our table. And uh, I remember one of them said uh, to George Tenet, uh, Mr. Director, um, the World Trade Tower has been just been attacked by an airplane. And I was struck by the fact to use the word attacked. An aide hands the CIA director a cell phone. And after he uh, handed the cell phone back to his uh, security person, he said to me, uh, you know, this has been Laden's fingerprints all over it. At their air base in Massachusetts, Duff and Nasty rocket into the air at 8.52 a.m., just six minutes after the first tower is hit. As we're climbing out, we, uh, we go supersonic on the way, which is kind of non-standard for us and, and nasty. I even called me in the actual and said, hey, Duff, you're super. I said, yeah, I know. You know, don't worry about it. I was kind of wondering why he was going so fast. We really didn't have um, verbal authorization to go supersonic. The fighters are hurtling toward New York at Mach 1.2, nearly 900 miles per hour. They are 153 miles from the World Trade Center.
I just wanted to get there quickly. We were going as fast as we could. I call for bogey to open. They say, your contact's over Kennedy. I said, OK, I know where that is. So we start heading right down Long Island, basically. 10 more minutes pass. There's a great deal of smoke billowing from the tower still. We can see flame coming out from at least two sides of the building. I uh, can't see around to the other side. Brian, could you, were you able to tell us uh, the size of the airplane? Was it a, a small plane, a commercial plane? Uh, do you have any idea at all? I will tell you from the size of the gash that the wingtip had to be at least 150 to 200 feet wide. Oh my God, oh. the next building There's is another one. Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> that looks like a second plane. As we just saw another plane coming in from the side. The second tower has exploded from about the 20 stories below in a gargantuan explosion. So this looks like it is some sort of a concerted effort to attack the World Trade Center that is underway. Jet fighters are still 60 miles away. It is just 16 minutes since the attacks began. Let's call for bogey up again, trying to get some information. And at that point, uh, they said the second aircraft just hit the World Trade Center. That was news to me. I thought we were still chasing American 11. There was smoke from fire uh, blowing south, east, uh, towards New Jersey. I had had my head down, basically looking at the radar scope. And we were about 60 miles out. And I could see the smoke from the towers. So uh, at that point, obviously, it, everything changed. When the second aircraft uh, flew into the second tower, it was at that point that we realized that the seemingly unrelated hijackings that the FAA was dealing with were in fact a part of a coordinated terrorist attack on the United States. At the Pentagon, Brigadier General W. Montague Winfield is in the loop with the Air Defense Command, and he alerts the Pentagon brass. The senior military and civilian leaders in the building began to filter into the National Military Command Center to get a situation update. And as you can imagine, the reports were numerous and conflicting. We would get duplicate reports, and we would get bogus reports. In Florida, President Bush is in the middle of a reading lesson with second graders. He doesn't know about the second crash. Ann Compton is covering the president this day. It all came to a blinding moment of realization when the president's chief of staff walked over to the president and whispered to him, nobody interrupts the president, not even in front of a second grade classroom. I tried to be very efficient with my words. I knew that this was not the place to stand and have a conversation with the president. I said, a second plane hit the second tower. America is under attack. And then I backed away from the president. And the president's eyes got wide and the face told it all. Something terribly grave something terribly serious, something beyond imagining. I think there was a, a moment of shock, and uh, he did stare off, uh, maybe for just a second. So much so that I wrote it down in my reporter's notebook in my, by my watch, 9.07 a.m. The president stays calm and lets the students finish. The president thought for a second or two about getting up and walking out of the room, but the drill was coming to a close and he didn't want to alarm the children. Instead, Bush pauses, thanks the children, Thank you also very much for showing me your reading skills. and heads for the empty classroom next door. He came back into the holding room. Uh, we had found a television, so we brought a television in so we could see TV, and they were replaying uh, the crash over and over again. And next to him, as he's walking by in the, uh, the classroom, you can see the, on the TV monitor the, the, the building's burning. White House photographer Eric Draper is with the president this day. His job is to chronicle Bush's every move in public and in private. We're seeing the, the video of the second plane hitting the second building for the, for the first time. And that's why uh, you see Dan Bartlett pointing to that video. You, you almost can't believe what you're seeing and, and just instinctively just pointed at it. And uh, but at that point, uh, the president briefly looked back at, at the images. The president said, I need to, I'm going to need to make a statement before we, we leave here. He was red, and I seen he had tears in his eyes, so I knew something bad had really, really happened. His face was just red, and he was, his lips were just trembling. He kind of stuttered when, um, when he talked, and he kind of said it all slowly. Uh, today, we've had a national tragedy. Two airplanes have crashed 
into the World Trade Center in an apparent terrorist attack on our country.